We're joined today by Dr. Juliana Bjerkan, who's going to talk to us about her research in the neurovascular dynamics of aging and dementia. Now, Juliana did this work with the nonlinear and biomedical physics group at Lancaster University, led by Professor Annetta Stefanowska. Now, the group are doing some fantastic work at the forefront of biomedical physics, and you can find out more about that work by clicking the link in the description below. Now, it's intended that Juliana's research will form the foundation for a new device which can provide early diagnosis of dementia and other neurodegenerative diseases. And that's just one of the potentially groundbreaking devices which the research group are working on right now. And we at Systemic Creative are supporting the group to help them bring these devices to market. So keep your eyes peeled on the channel for some exciting updates. Now, before we dive into today's content, a quick word from our video sponsor. EcoWorthy make high quality solar power solutions for remote applications, such as camper vans or boats. Now we're using one of their solar kits with this flexible panel integrated with the bike generator. So we've got a charge controller, 50 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery, and a 600 watt pure sound wave inverter. So as you can see, we're charging a laptop, a power bank and a phone, and because this is all connected to the bike generator, we can generate power day or night. Now, EcoWorthy have got some great deals on at the moment for viewers of the channel. So if you want to get your hands on some of this awesome kit at a really good price and support the channel while you're doing it, use the link in the description. As many of you know, the incidence of dementia is rising, and so is the need to diagnose and monitor the progression of dementia. Today, we will focus on neurovascular dynamics, because the brain needs a lot of energy to function properly. In fact, it needs as much as 20% of the body's energy consumption, despite only weighing around 2% of the body's weight. In addition, there are several cardiovascular risk factors associated with dementia. Locally in the brain, the neurovascular unit is responsible to direct blood flow to areas of the brain with increased energy demand. The neurovascular unit consists of neurons and the microvasculature, as well as several cells known as glial cells, such as astrocytes, that help the communication between the neurons and the microvasculature. So example cells are also smooth muscle cells and microglia. With age and also dementia, there are several changes to the neurovascular unit. For example, we know with age that the microvascular density reduces and it further reduces with Alzheimer's disease. With age, we tend to get less vessel elasticity and higher blood pressure. And with Alzheimer's disease, it's known that the astrocytes function is altered. The problem we would like to address is how do we reliably evaluate the function of the neurovascular unit in humans, in vivo, and relatively cheaply. To do this, we have to consider that we have interacting networks. So we have the neurovascular unit, which is a functional unit consisting of the different cell types that are interacting. In addition, the neurovascular unit relies on the support of the cardiorespiratory system as the heart pumps the blood to the brain and the lungs oxygenate the blood. And within the cardiorespiratory system, we have cardiorespiratory interactions where the heart rate generally depends on your breathing. To measure the neurovascular and the cardiorespiratory dynamics, we use non-invasive measurement techniques. Functional near infrared spectroscopy measures brain oxygenation, EEG measures brain electrical activity, ECG measures heart rate, and a respiration belt measures the respiration. So, here you can see on Andrew who's wearing the respiration belt. When he breathes in, his chest expands, and when he breathes out, it contracts, and the stretch is measured by the belt. On his head, he's wearing a hat, and on this we put the EEG electrodes and the functional near infrared spectroscopy probes, and these can be seen here. They consist of an emitter of near-infrared light and also a detector that measures the backscattered light. So we do this to monitor the function of the neurovascular unit. In this figure you see a sketch of the cardiovascular system and also examples of the various signals that we measure. 
So at the top you see a functional near infrared spectroscopy or FNIR signal. We then see the EEG signal, the respiration and also the ECG. What you might have noticed from the signals, even though they were only shown for seven seconds, is that they had a repeating pattern, so they contain oscillations. And these oscillations have traditionally been divided into different frequency bands depending on how quick or slow these oscillations are. Taking for example the heartbeat. At rest the human heart beats approximately once a second or at one hertz, uh, and that is in the cardiovascular uh, oscillations box. We also have respiration, which is a slower oscillation, usually around 0.3 hertz in arresting humans. And then even slower oscillations tend to be more related to local processes of blood flow regulation. And we say, for example, myogenic frequency band is usually associated to the smooth muscle cell activity in the vessels. For example, the smooth muscle cells which line the blood vessels can contract or dilate and thereby changing the shape of the blood vessel, thereby controlling the blood flow going through the blood vessel. And this is illustrated in this film. The similar approach can be taken with brain oscillations, though they tend to be quicker. And they are usually in divided into delta, theta, alpha, beta and gamma band, but there are also slower brain oscillations, often called slow or infraslow oscillations. So what we have is several challenges that we must take into account when we analyse our measured data. We have many oscillatory processes operating on different timescales, so some are very quick, some are slower, and that is known as multi-scale dynamics. Further, we have interacting networks causing complex dynamics, so they're depending on each other and influencing each other. And we're also dealing with an open system. That means that living systems exchange matter and energy with the environment, and this leads to time-varying dynamics. Our approach is to determine the presence and the strength of oscillations, and to do this, we use the wavelet transform. We also determine the presence of coordinated oscillation. And for this, we use wavelet phase coherence. To illustrate what we mean, first to determine the presence and strength of oscillations. Here you will see two sinusoidal signals, one black with higher amplitude and the orange one with lower amplitude. The power of the orange is therefore lower than the power of the black signal. However, this is extremely simplified. There is no time varying frequency here. Instead, our signal tends to look more like this. Here you see 20 minutes of an FNIR signal in the time domain at the top. We then apply the wavelet transform and we get the bottom left figure. And a higher orange or red color indicates a higher amplitude at this frequency. So you can see the x-axis is time the y-axis is frequency, and then the color scale shows amplitude. And around 1 hertz, you can see a clear higher amplitude throughout the whole signal, and that corresponds to the heartbeat, the heart beating blood up to the brain. There's also several slower frequencies as well. And you'll notice that the wavelet transform has a logarithmic frequency resolution, and this is a huge benefit when we're dealing with multiscale signals. For the wavelet phase coherence, we have two signals. In this, you see an instantaneous heart rate in A and a respiration signal in B. We then use the wavelet transform to obtain the instantaneous phases throughout time, and they are shown in C and D for each signal. We then want to evaluate how consistent is the phase difference between these two signals at the different frequencies throughout time. And to go with two examples, we choose 0.1 Hz and 0.3 Hz. In E, you can see the phase difference at 0.1 Hz, and you'll see it tends to be quite irregular. You can't clearly see a pattern. 
And indeed, this corresponds to a very low phase coherence if you see in G, with the big red, light red ball indicated. If we then focus on F at 0.3 Hz, which is around this participant's respiration rate, you can see that the phase difference between the respiration and instantaneous heart rate is very regular. And this corresponds to a high wavelet phase coherence, which you can see in G, as the dark red dot uh, around 0.3. So the wavelet phase coherence is quantified um, with this equation, and note again that it has logarithmic frequency resolution, uh, which is again very useful when we're dealing with multiscale signals. We use wavelet phase coherence to evaluate the neurovascular phase coherence, doing the wavelet transform of an EEG and an FNR signal, and then looking at how consistent the phase difference is. However, wavelet phase coherence is not zero for two random signals, and we therefore need a method to evaluate when the coherence we find is significant. And for this we're going to use intersubject surrogates. That means that we use two signals from different participants and we calculate the coherence between those two signals. So for example, I could use my instantaneous heart rate and Andrew's respiration signal, and they should in no way be interacting and influencing each other. And so the coherence obtained that way would be random. And by doing many, many, many of these intersubject surrogates, we obtain what is known as a surrogate threshold and we subtract this from the original coherence we calculated and only coherence above the threshold is considered significant and that is the coherence we take on when we are comparing the groups. And for this we are comparing a healthy younger group around 30 years old and a healthy older group around 65 years old. We're also going to compare a healthy elderly group around 68 years old and a group of people with Alzheimer's disease, which is around 71 years old. And we're going to compare the neurovascular coherence first. So as I said earlier, we have 16 EEG signals per participant, and you can see these on the y-axis. We also have 11 FNERS signals per participant, which is on the x-axis. Each little square in this bigger square corresponds to the median group coherence between each FNERS probe and EEG combination. To the left we have the younger group, in the middle we have the older group, and to the right you see where we found significant differences between the two groups. If the colour is blue or purple, that means the younger group had higher coherence than the older group. And this is the case in 45 uh, of the combinations. The head plots show the same information as the squared plots, uh, just onto the brain. So you can get an idea of where these differences were found. Going on to the Alzheimer's data. You see the controls to the left, you see the Alzheimer's in the middle, and you see the significant differences again to the right. And again, if it is blue or purple for the significant differences, it means that the control group had higher coherence than the Alzheimer's group, which also was the case. Looking at the more complete picture of our results, first compare the EEG power in the frequency bands of the myogenic and the cardiac band. And we see there are generally few differences between the two groups. If we go on to the FNERS power or the oxygenation power, we see in the myogenic frequency band, which was associated with the smooth muscle cells, there is a significant difference between the younger and the older group in eight of the location, and there's a significant difference between the control and Alzheimer's group in four location. And both in cases the younger group had higher power or the control group had higher power. However, in the cardiac band, uh, there are few differences. Similarly, for FNERS coherence, so the coherence between the oxygenation signals measured at different location, in the myogenic band, the younger group has higher coherence and the control group has higher coherence. However, in the cardiac band, we see the opposite. The older group has higher coherence than the younger group, but the Alzheimer's group has lower coherence 
than the control group. And then for the FNERS EEG coherence or the neurovascular coherence, you have already seen the results for the myogenic band and then the cardiac band is also shown. So to conclude, the neurovascular coherence is reduced with age and it's further reduced with Alzheimer's disease. And we observe these changes and can relate them to well-known structural and functional changes that has already been shown, such as reduced microvascular density in Alzheimer's disease. Local control of blood flow, especially by smooth muscle cells, is reduced with age and it's further reduced with Alzheimer's disease. So to conclude the talk, simultaneous measurements of brain oxygenation and electrical activity combined with the finite time analysis methods that's been developed here at Lancaster University, provide new insights into the functioning of the neurovascular unit, both in health and disease. And this could be a new method to non-invasively, reliably, and also relatively inexpensively diagnose and follow up the progression of neurovascular diseases. Thank you very much, Juliana. I hope you guys found that interesting and fascinating. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to see you guys building the device that I know can help so many people. We will keep you updated on that, so keep your eyes peeled on the channel for progress. Uh, and if you're interested in the methodologies which underpin this study, we have a video coming up on the channel from Dr. Julian Newman, who will talk to us about time frequency analysis and wavelet phase coherence, which were a core part of analysing the data for this study. So thank you for watching, and we will see you next time.